We're going to be talking about the four-step urban transportation planning model in this part of the course. Since there are four steps, there'll be lectures on each component. The first step is trip generation, which is how many trips are entering or leaving a place. We typically define places using transportation analysis zones. So for instance, the Twin Cities region is now divided into 3,000 transportation analysis zones, or TAZs. Each one would then have about, on average, 1,000 residents. But this will vary because some of them are job-oriented, some of them are at the university, and will have fewer residents in those zones. Others will be more residential areas, but that will give you a sense of how large these are. Trip generation asks how many trips are entering or leaving a zone, or how many trips an individual is making, and of course, that individual is based in a particular place. The next step is destination choice. How many trips are going from one zone to another, from one place to another? We usually refer to the origin zone as zone I and the destination zone as zone J. Any zone can be both an origin and a destination, but when it's an origin, it's I, and when it's a destination, it's J. And then we want to know what mode they're going to use. This is mode choice. The question is, how many trips from I to J are using mode M? Which trips are using which mode? And there's some number of modes. How many trips from I to J by mode M are using route R? We know that you are driving from point A to point B, or from zone I to zone J, we want to know which route you are taking because there are many possible routes. There are many assumptions embedded in our methods for route choice. We talked about models and frameworks in a previous lecture. Recall models were mathematical representations while frameworks were qualitative organizing principles. Is this general approach a model or framework? I would argue the whole thing is a model because it's quantitative. Each of the model components is a model, and each of these components might have submodels within it. First thing to keep in mind is this general approach. It's called the four-step urban transportation planning model because there are, or at least originally were, four steps. Real transportation planning models are much more complicated. For instance, you might want to model when trips occur by time of day. So you have a scheduling component. You may want to know with whom activities are being undertaken or with whom trips are being made. So you have an accompaniment component. It's not just, are you using a mode, but if you are carpooling, who are you carpooling with? Somebody in your household or somebody outside your household. There are many carpooling trips by people within the same household than outside. It's a lot more convenient to ride from home to work with somebody who lives in the same household because you can harass them at home. It's more difficult to go to somebody else's house and honk the horn outside and wait for them. We often predict trip generation at the individual level. How many trips an individual will make? And not just the number of trips, you might want to predict the pattern of trips. We want to know not just that somebody is going to make 10 trips today, but whether they're going to make a trip from home to other, and then other to work, and then work to other, and then other to other before returning home, as shown on the slide. And if we're doing scheduling, we care not just about the sequence of activities, but also the time spent at the destinations. And then we might aggregate the trip, trip patterns of each individual up to the zonal level. Or we might keep it at the individual level and then use the information about that person to try to predict where they're going to go, what travel mode that person is going to use. Then we might aggregate the more detailed travel patterns in the downstream steps of the four-step model, destination choice and mode choice. To assign it to the transportation network in the fourth step of the travel demand model, route choice, we might keep each individual traveler separate still. To be clear, there is movement away from an aggregate zone-based models which have been used since the 1950s and comprise the planning model in most metropolitan areas towards something that's more individually based. The hope is that individually based models will be more accurate and certainly more sensitive to policies. The potential cost is greater complexity. The first step is trip generation, which basically asks the same question that Richard Scarry asked, what do people do all day? This was one of my favorite books growing up. In it, Scarry has a page which says, everyone is a worker. In one sense, everyone is a worker. In another, about half the people are workers and half paid employment. Many of you have outside jobs, but some of you don't. You might have siblings who are still in school. They're not workers, they're students in the modeling framework. You may have parents who have a paid job, or not. You might have grandparents who are more likely to be retired as they get older. So not everyone is a worker, but many are, and many more are workers at some point during their life cycle. What activities do people have? They're coming from home, they're going to work, these are called purposes. They might eat out, engage in social activities, like going to a Roman bath. So we don't go out for baths anymore, but people once did, and that was a trip purpose. People go shopping, go to recreation, go to school, go to the doctor's office, going to the bank, going to any kinds of other activities. Why do we want to track the different types of activities and locations that people want to go to? 
Well, travel behavior might vary by trip purpose. So first of all, if we want to know whether they're going to work or not, travelers will only go to work at places where work occurs. Though for some jobs, work occurs anywhere, for instance, construction. Most jobs occur at fixed workplaces. Jobs are going to be located in certain places. And if we want to figure out how many people are going from point A to point B, we need to know what's going on at points A and B and what the objective is of that trip. In modeling jargon, trips are produced at an origin and attracted to a destination. Trips are characterized by purposes, the activity undertaken at a destination location. If we want to figure out how many people are going to Minneapolis, the number of jobs in Minneapolis is really important, and the number of work trips generated or produced throughout the region is really important. Then we need to match those two things. We do that in the destination choice section. Why are work trips important? Because they're recurring. When do they tend to occur? Well, disproportionately, people go from home to work during rush hour in the morning and from work to home in rush hour in the afternoon. And ironically, they're called rush hour because people are using those times of day more than others and in a rush, not getting anywhere fast. Of course, as long as travel is non-uniform, some time of day must be busier than others. We would call those periods the peaks. Many of the critical problems on the transportation system, the congestion peaks on the transportation system that we see, are caused because workers are traveling at the same time. So if they were spread out throughout the day, some people went to work at 8 a.m., some people went to work at 9, some people went to work at 10, 11, 12, 1 in the afternoon, and so on, we'd flatten out the peaks in travel and it wouldn't be such a critical time period, the rush hour. But because workers tend to be so concentrated, that creates issues. Of all trip purposes across the day, 22% are, are, are work trips, 7% are work-related, and that is people who are on the job and going from one meeting to another at a different building. 3% are attending school, another 1% attending civic or religious activities, um, child care, shopping, and so on. The key here is that only 22% of all trips are for work trips. We think about them as the most important. They have longer distances on average than most of these other trip purposes, but they're fewer than a quarter of all trips. The interesting thing is not only are they less than a quarter of all trips, they're less than half of the trips during rush hour. There's a lot of other travel going on during rush hour. That doesn't mean those activities can be easily moved. Of course, with work trips, people say, I can't change when my job is, and people certainly can't do that easily in many cases. But other kinds of activities also can't be easily changed. School operates on different shifts than office work, but they can't operate on shifts that are too different because parents still have to watch younger children or arrange for someone else to do it. This may be why high schools are dismissed before elementary schools, so older kids can act as, as babysitters for their younger siblings, in addition to the scheduling of school buses so that not everybody gets out at the same time. If you have to pick up a child from school that runs on a fixed schedule as well, and you have little flexibility about travel. Pickup is perhaps even more fixed than your work schedule. On the other hand, eating out can be changed more easily. If you're a senior citizen and you're getting on the roads at 4 p.m. in the afternoon to get the early bird discount at a restaurant, you might change your behavior if we charged you more money to travel at that time than others. So there are many trips for which travelers lack flexibility. We call these mandatory trips. Some trips you have some flexibility for instance, shopping. But then again, many shopping trips are chained with work trips, so the traveler is going from work to shop and then from shop to home. And the trip has a work component there and a shop component somewhere else. A shopping trip might be a little bit out of the way, but it's not that much out of the way. So some of these are work-related in that they're part of a work trip chain, and some of these are people who are starting at home, going out shopping, and then going back home. Home-based shopping trips might have more flexibility as to when they occur than work-based shopping. Visiting friends, some of that's done on the way home, some of it's done leaving from home. Personal business, like going to the bank and so on, also have these kinds of differences. Some of these have more discretion than others, some of them are more mandatory than others, and those are key distinctions when we're thinking about transportation policies. Knowing where people work is important, but it's not just where they're going. There's also differences in other travel behaviors. For instance, when they're going. You tend to go to work when the work tends to start, so work hours tend to begin for office workers between 8 and 9 a.m. But many people aren't office workers. Factory workers, construction workers, or surveyors, garbage collectors, nurses, doctors, police, firefighters, and so on all work on different shifts. Most workers aren't office workers. It was about 41% according to a 1998 study. 
But the office workers are the ones who tend to have one shift per day in offices, and that shift tends to run from 9 to 5 or 8 to 4. We all work at different times, but office workers are driving the peak nature of rush hour. The mental model of the planners and decision makers, because planners and decision makers work in offices, is that everybody works like planners do. Only some 40 to 50 percent of workers actually work in offices. When planners and policymakers work in downtown, their mental model is that everybody is commuting to downtown, which is also very far from the case. Obviously, if you ask them, they are aware of other types and places of work, but the problems they are trying to solve disproportionately resemble their own. The share of downtown employment has been declining steadily for the last five or six decades. The total number of employees in downtown Minneapolis, for instance, has been flat for decades, while the region itself has grown. The numbers here are for the city of Minneapolis as a whole. But people who work downtown are making these decisions. They, like everyone, has a perception bias. They see the problem of themselves and their own commute, and they extrapolate it. Now, why are all jobs starting at the same time? Employers want their employees to be able to work together, either with each other or with people at other organizations. Firms are trying to achieve an economy of coordination. We want to be able to coordinate the work that people are doing, and that requires them being at work at the same time, or at least at some over large overlapping period of time. Playing a board game without other players there at the same time would be cumbersome at best. Attempts to spread the peak by encouraging some firms to have workers starting at 6 a.m. or 10 a.m. haven't been terribly successful because they're fighting against the coordination economy, the benefits that firms get from everyone being in place at the same time. So there are reasons that we have such sharp peaks. Coordination is not just within the same firm at the same place, it is also required between firms and between places. Start times run earlier in the Midwest than they do on the East Coast. So the average job which starts at 9 a.m. on the East Coast starts closer to 8 a.m. in the Midwest so people in the Midwest can be in the office at the same time as people on the East Coast. Again, it's a coordination economy. It's not because Midwesterners inherently favor getting up early. However, it is not shifted so that most West Coast workers go to, go to work at 6 a.m. Rather, they go to work at 9 a.m. as well, as if it's a different country. Look at the stock exchanges. The major stock markets run almost 24 hours a day, but not each stock market runs 24 hours a day. Basically, you've got the hours of the London Exchange, which opens at 3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the hours of the New York Stock Exchange, which opens at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then the hours of the Tokyo Exchange, which opens at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Traders who are doing arbitrage have to be up overlapping these. Some people work in the middle of the night, local time, because they're watching markets across the world. Every trip has two ends. For the transportation planning model, we want to know the number of trips coming from a zone and the number of trips going to a zone. We often talk about trip, trip ends. Traffic engineers, as opposed to transportation planners, do this regularly in practice. Traffic engineers have produced the ITE Trip Generation Manual. ITE is the Institute of Transportation Engineers. They're the professional association for transportation engineers and analysts. They put out a book that looks at the numbers of trips that are leaving or going to a particular place as a function of one key characteristic of that place. But they're all looking at one end of the trip because they're looking at it from the perspective of a traffic impact study for a proposed new building, such as a gas station or apartment building or office building or factory or cemetery or nunnery. How many trips is it going to generate? How many trips are going to go to it? They don't care about where they're coming from because that origin is likely outside the study area. Similarly, they're looking at how many trips are leaving their site regardless of where they're going. From a transportation planning model perspective, though, we need to track both ends of each trip because every trip has to have an origin and a destination and every trip has an activity at the destination end, and there's a sequence of activities. When you filled out your travel diary, hopefully you saw, that you saw yourself engaged in a sequence of activities. You start out the day at home. Almost everyone starts out the day at home. You might start the day at somebody else's home. You might start out the day at a hotel, but you're starting out the day at some particular place. You might have gone to work. You might have gone to school in your, in your case. You might have gone out to shop to eat out. Then we close the loop and you end the day at the same place you started your day. Now obviously this isn't true for everybody, but this is true typically. When we're doing this systematically for a region, we start travel diaries in the middle of the night thinking that most people are sleeping in the middle of the night, and that's a convenient time to start, like at 4 a.m. in the morning. Still, some people are out working at 4 a.m., so it doesn't work for everybody, but it works for most people. And then we can find this sequence of trips, home to work, work to shop, shop to eat, eat out, return home. And that's the person's chip trip chain. Earlier, we talked about 11 different activity types. We can simplify that to four using the category other as a catch-all. In principle, if you think about there being four activity types, you could have a four-by-four four matrix 
of different trip interchanges. And the reason we want to know what trip interchange you'd be going on, are you going from shop to work, for instance, is that trips are going from shop to work or work to shop are going to have a different trip length distribution than trips that are going from home to work or home to shop. We want to be able to track these things individually. Now from work to work, you're not going to be going from your workplace to the same workplace. Instead, you might be going on a work-related trip to a different workplace. Some people have jobs that are at multiple locations, field work, or have an in-day meeting, or something like that. Home to home, similarly, you're not going from your home to your own home. You might be going to somebody else's home. If we had a 4x4 four four matrix, there'd be 16 different things we have to track. If we were an 11x11 11 11 matrix, there'd be 121 trip purpose interchanges that we would have to track. We'd say, that's too many. We'd simplify that problem, say which of these are going to have the same type of trip lengths, and group them. How do we trip predict how many trips are going to be produced in a zone? How do we Pause predict the video, how many trips will be list produced of explanatory by a zone? Pause the video, trip develop types. a list of explanatory as factors hypothesis, of trip what types. What do you think is going to that is occur from hypothesis. as a result of... Um, the number, the number of bah. When we're looking at trips at the home end, we might think that the total number of trips produced from or returning to homes in a particular zone may be described as a function of the number of housing units, the household size, the age, income, accessibility, and vehicle ownership. Clearly, accessibility and vehicle ownership require knowing something about the network, and so they may have to be solved recursively. Going from or to work requires knowing something about the size of the workplace. How many square feet of space do you have of office building or of stores? And what is the occupancy rate? So we might ask how many people work in a particular building? How many people work at the University of Minnesota Civil Engineering Building, which is shown on the left? Now, probably more than 200. You can think about it. Almost all the graduate students have jobs, plus 30-some faculty and 30-some staff. And then there are some number of undergraduates who are also employed. But we don't actually know how many people work in the Civil Engineering Building. And the number of people who are assigned to work in the Civil Engineering Building aren't the number of people who are physically working in the building on a given day because a lot of people who work in the Civil Engineering Department actually work at the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory or actually work at the Mass Lab or actually work somewhere else. Or they may be working at home on a given day. They may officially work at the Civil Engineering Building, but they're not there every day at the building. This is an especially hard problem here because students have very unusual work schedules and faculty have a lot of flexibility. But this is the same kind of problem that's true in any office building. How many people work in the IDS tower, shown on the right? Well, it's very different every day because every day somebody quits their job or leaves or is unemployed or is on vacation or a firm moves from a building to another building. There's vacancies and that varies with the economy. So there's no one answer to how many people work in a given building and we have averages. And so we're looking at area of space by type, and we say, okay, there is on average 175 square feet per office employee, or some number like that. And the number of jobs we can calculate based on the size of the building and the number of feet per employee, but it's not as precise as we would like. The number of trips produced or attracted to a, a purpose in a zone are described by trip rates, a cross-classification by age or demographics. Um, we might want to ask how many people are going to or from a store. If you're working and doing a traffic impact study for a proposed shopping center, this is a very important number. But how many people are going to go to a particular shopping center? It differs every day. It's different depending on the retail mix. It's different depending on the competition that a center has. A Menards across the street from a Home Depot is going to have a very different number of shoppers than a Menards that's built where there's no competition nearby, all else equal. There are many th things affecting the number of trips, and those things are also changing. Thus, you have to make some sort of average prediction. The ITE Trip Generation Manual I mentioned before We'll look at the square footage of retail activity by type and make some pretty crude estimates of the average number of trips that are going to be go going to and from a particular store. But it's very hard to stay. If you were to replace a tailor shop with an Apple shop, the Apple store is certainly going to get a lot more business than the tailor did, and so you're going to get a lot more traffic coming in. But we don't know five years from now what type of store is going to occupy any particular square footage in a shopping center. That's unknowable. So we have to make these averages, and there's a set of factors that are important there. There are many problems with averages and aggregation. Everybody's trip making patterns are different. We talked in previous lectures about the model building process. We talked about specification of the model. So how you specify the model determines how it's going to work. So we might specify trip generation using a cross-classification model, where the dependent variable is trips per person. The independent variables are dwelling type, household size, and person age. And we also similarly have to do something at the non-home end. So 
Instead of using a regression model, we're doing a cross-classification model, and we have a table and figure out how many trips cross -class or there are cross-classified by different characteristics. For instance, you might want to look at people by their housing type on one axis and their age on the other axis, and then predict the number of trips by 40 to 45-year-olds who live in single-family homes. You could compare that to 40 to 45-year-olds who live in apartments. That's a simpler way of building your model. You might be looking at data that looks like this, that is the age distribution versus number of trips, separated by people who live in single-family and multifamily residences, which might account for income effects. You can see this looks very noisy. So is this, is this behavior really this volatile? Do 42-year-olds really have different trip-making characteristics than 43-year-olds? It probably is not this volatile. It's likely that the data is noisy, but you can smooth the data. So the graph here is a five-year moving average. There are many different types of smoothing functions. A good smoothing function makes the data appear a lot less volatile but it's still noisy. If you aggregate it into five-year cohorts or 10-year cohorts, you'd smooth it out even more. The general pattern, however, is that in middle years, you make more trips than when you're very old or when you're very young. And there are, very, and there are a few differences. People who live in single-family homes make a few more trips than people who live in multifamily homes. On average, people who live in single-family homes have a somewhat higher income than people who live in apartments, but of course, that's not universally true. So you get to the question, which is more accurate, the data or the model? Often the model is a better representation of reality than the raw data that you have because the raw data is just a sample. Let's say we're trying to predict the aggregate zone level trip generation at the non-home end during the afternoon peak period. We might specify the model as shown. The number of trips depends on the number of office employees, other employees, and retail employees. The number of trips is the dependent variable. The number of employees by type are the independent or explanatory variables. The results shown in this table are from a regression model, fitting the model specified on the previous slide. We estimate the number of workers leaving an origin zone in the afternoon peak as a function of office employment, other employment, retail employment. The table shows model coefficients we estimated from our ordinary least squares regression model. Since those estimates come from a model, we can also compute a t-statistic. What is the t-statistic? It tells us sig statistical significance higher t-statistic is better. For a two-sided t-test with 30 observations, to have 90% confidence that your value is different from zero, you want a t-statistic greater than 1.7. For 95%, you want a t-statistic greater than 2.0. And for 99%, you want a t-statistic greater than 2.75. A t-statistic of 22.4 indicates it is far more likely that the value of the coefficient for office employees is statistically different from zero than a t-statistic of 0 0.5. Interestingly, the t-statistic was introduced in an article signed student. The student was later revealed to be William Seeley Gossett, who worked for Guinness Brewery. Thus, returning to the model, we can rely on the rate we estimated the number of trips coming from office employees, but the rate for retail employees is very volatile, and the number is not statistically different from zero. We do have reason to believe that retail jobs will, in fact, generate trips. The more retail employees there are in a zone, there should be more trips because of them. First, the store clerks are going to work themselves, but not only that. Retail employees should also generate non-work trips. They are staffing stores, which should be attracting some positive number of customers. It's hard to imagine that more retail employees would result in fewer trips, but the data in this case is not strong enough to tell us that, so the t-statistic coming out of the model estimation is important. So here we have a typical problem. If a traffic zone has a population of 500, 100 office employees, 40 industrial employees, 30 retail employees. Using the model that's shown in the upper right, calculate the PM peak period work to home trips generated at the work end. All we're doing is we're solving this model using the data we have and plugging the rate multiplied by the factor that's affecting it. So, 100 office employees times a rate of 0.5 trips per office employees in the afternoon peak plus 40 other employees times 0.355 plus 30 retail employees times 0.095 trips per retail employee, and we add it up and we estimate there'll be 67 work-to-home trips coming out of that zone in the afternoon peak period. That's how we apply these models.